Well, good evening, everybody, all those at home on live stream and all those who are here. We have an interesting study. If you're not in the building and you want the notes from tonight, we will have them available on Sunday morning. We're doing the book of Genesis. We're going to begin with an overview that we've looked at before from the Bible Project. We're going to watch a little eight-minute video that sort of summarizes the first 11 chapters. And then tonight, we're going to sort of look at the first few verses as to what we can glean from that about the book of Genesis to set a good foundation for an expositional study through the book of Genesis, which will <clears throat> take a number of weeks. So tonight is simply part one. And there'll be, instead of naming the verses or the reference, it'll be part two next Wednesday and part three. And it could go, I don't know, months. I had a professor when I was at Liberty who his favorite book was the book of Genesis. And he started preaching it at his church on a Sunday morning. And it took him three years to get through it. He said everybody in his church was so sick of the book of Genesis. But he said there's just so much in it. And then he taught it to us. And it is. It's an amazing book that we'll get to in just a moment. I want to let you know that Steve Catlin is doing much better. Uh, I'm going to have a chance to see him tomorrow. He has a restricted visitor protocol for him. But they did determine that he does not have cancer in his colon. They're still checking a few other things in his liver, but he is doing better, so thank you for praying for him. Mo Bowman is still scheduled for his heart procedure. It has not occurred yet. Ann Quinn is recovering from her cancer surgery. And if you'd please pray for all of them that they can heal and recover well from, from what they're facing. And, um, and pray for our nation. We have a few days left for all the confusion to sort itself out. If you're like me, you might have a preference as to what you hope happens and what you've been reading will happen, that you hope it does, but whatever, we have to make sure that our nation uh, stands strong, stays secure, and stays safe and peaceful so that we can continue, as the Bible says, to preach the gospel because God is not willing that any should perish, and our turmoil and upheaval and corruption could prevent the sharing of the gospel. But just be in prayer, don't make any bets and don't rest your uh, well-being and sense of peace on political outcomes. But I know you're curious like me. I'd say just keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, and let's watch what happens between now and January the 21st. Let's have a word of prayer, then we'll begin with the video for tonight, the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the privilege to be here tonight to gather those of us who are here and those who are watching on live stream, either live or who will watch it later when it's archived, we pray that you will encourage each one of us with this amazing book and that our faith is not some conjured up philosophy of life to get us through the day, but it has deep rootings that go all the way back to the creation of the world. And we can rely on those foundations and we can see the logical growth out until the New Testament gospel being revealed to us and then the return of Jesus Christ Himself. I pray that we will learn from this study, we'll grow from the study, and each one of us will have a greater appreciation of the work of grace that you have begun in us and performed for us and have certainly concluded. And someday we will enjoy that conclusion. We pray for our nation tonight. We pray for the congressmen and senators who are involved in very difficult decisions, the turmoil about the impeachment, uh, the potential fraud in the election, the imposing of uh, protocols that might make everyone uncomfortable and all the things that may or may not happen in the next seven or eight days. We just pray you'll give us patience, help us look to you for peace, but we do pray that you will protect, bless, and correct our country and may it return once again to the um, untethered nation of free speech where the gospel or the Biblical principles we share are not hindered from public exposure. We ask you to intervene and keep us all safe. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, tonight's video is from the Bible Project. We have watched it before, but it's, it was a while ago, and this is a good review. And we have a chart for you to look at it and so you can recall what's said. If you're not here tonight, you can pick up one of these on Sunday out at the Welcome Center. All right, if you could lower the lights. Can you do that? Can you lower the lights? All right, we'll begin the, the video. The book of Genesis 
It's the first book of the Bible, and its storyline divides into two main parts. There's chapters 1 through 11, which tell the story of God and the whole world. And then there's chapters 12 through 50, which zoom in and tell the story of God and just one man, Abraham, and then his family. And these two parts are connected by a hinge story at the beginning of chapter 12. And this design, it gives us a clue to how to understand the message of the book as a whole and how it introduces the story of the whole Bible. So the book begins with God taking the disorder and the darkness described in the second sentence of the Bible, and God brings out of it order and beauty and goodness. He makes a world where life can flourish. And God makes these creatures called humans, or Adam in Hebrew. He makes them in his image, which has to do with their role and purpose in God's world. So the humans are made to be reflections of God's character out into the world. And they're appointed as God's representatives to rule his world on his behalf. Which in context means to harness all of its potential, to care for it, and make it a place where even more life can flourish. God blesses the humans. It's a key word in this book. And he gives them a garden. It's like a place from which they begin starting to build this new world. Now the key is that the humans have a choice about how they're going to go about building this world. And that's represented by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Up till now, God has provided and defined what is good and what is not good. But now God is giving the humans the dignity and the freedom of a choice. Are they going to trust God's definition of good and evil, or are they going to seize autonomy and define good and evil for themselves? And the stakes are really high. To rebel against God is to embrace death, because you're turning away from the giver of life himself. This is represented by the tree of life. And so in chapter 3, a, a mysterious figure, a snake, enters into the story. The snake's given no introduction other than it's a creature that God made. And it becomes clear that it's a creature in rebellion against God, and it wants to lead the humans into rebellion and their death. The snake tells a different story about the tree and the choice. It says that seizing the knowledge of good and evil are not going to bring death, that it's actually the way to life and becoming like God themselves. Now the irony of this is tragic because we know the humans, they're already like God. They were made to reflect God's image. But instead of trusting God, the humans seize autonomy. They take the knowledge of good and evil for themselves and in an instant, the whole story spirals out of control. The first casualty is human relationships. The man and the woman, they suddenly realize how vulnerable they are now. They can't even trust each other. And so they make clothes and they hide their bodies from one another. The second casualty is that intimacy between God and the humans is lost. So they go and run and hide from God. And then when God finds them, they start this game of blame shifting about who rebelled first. Now right here the story stops, and there's a series of short poems where God declares to the snake and then to the humans the tragic consequences of their actions. God first tells the snake that despite its apparent victory, it is destined for defeat to eat dust. God promises that one day a seed or a descendant will come from the woman who's going to deliver a lethal strike to the snake's head which sounds like great news, but this victory is going to come with a cost because the snake too will deliver a lethal strike to the descendant's heel as it's being crushed. It's a very mysterious promise of this wounded victor. But in the flow of the story so far, you see this is an act of God's grace. The humans, they've just rebelled, and what does God do? He promises to rescue them. But this doesn't erase the consequences of the human's decision. So God informs them that now every aspect of their life together at home and out in the field, it's going to be fraught with grief and pain because of the rebellion, all leading to their death. From here, the story then spirals downward. Chapters 3 through 11, they trace the widening ripple effect of the rebellion and of human relationships fracturing at every level. So there's a story about two brothers, Cain and Abel. Cain's so jealous of his brother that he wants to murder him. And God warns him not to give in to the temptation, but he does anyway. He murders him in the field. So Cain then goes on to build a city where violence and oppression reign. And this is all epitomized in the story of Lamech. He's the first man in the Bible to have more than one wife. He's accumulating them like property. And then he goes on to sing a short song about how he's more violent and vengeful than Cain ever was. After this, we get an odd story about the sons of God. 
which could refer to evil angelic beings, or it could refer to ancient kings who claimed that they descended from the gods. And like Lamech, they acquire as many wives as they wanted, and they produce the Nephilim, these great warriors of old. Whichever view is right, the point is that humans are building kingdoms that fill God's world with violence and even more corruption. In response, we're told that God is broken with grief. Humanity is ruining his good world, and they're ruining each other. And so out of a passion to protect the goodness of his world, he washes it clean of humanity's evil with a great flood. But he protects one blameless human, Noah, and his family, and he commissions him as a new Adam. He repeats the divine blessing and commissions him to go out into the world. And so our hopes are really high, but then Noah fails too, and also in a garden. He goes and he plants a vineyard, and he gets drunk out of his mind. And then one of his sons, Ham, does something shameful to his father in the tent. And so here we have our new Adam, naked and ashamed just like the first, and the downward spiral begins again. It all leads to the foundation of the city of Babylon. The people of ancient Mesopotamia, they come together around this new technology they have, the brick. And they can make cities and towers bigger and faster than anybody's ever done before. And they want to build a new kind of tower that will reach up to the gods and they will make a great name for themselves. It's an image of human rebellion and arrogance. It's the garden rebellion now writ large. And so God humbles their pride and scatters them. Now this is a diverse group of stories, but you can see they're all exploring the same basic point. God keeps giving humans the chance to do the right thing with his world, and humans keep ruining it. These stories are making a claim that we live in a good world that we have turned bad, that we've all chosen to define good and evil for ourselves, and so we all contribute to this world of broken relationships, leading to conflict and violence and ultimately death. But there's hope. God promised that one day a descendant would come, the wounded victor who will defeat evil at its source. And so despite humanity's evil, God is determined to bless and rescue his world. And so the big question, of course, is what is God going to do? And the next story, The Hinge, offers the answer. But for now, that's what Genesis 1-11 through 11 is all about. Okay, that's a, that's a great quick review or overview of the book of Genesis. And let me say from the outset that I believe the book of Genesis is an actual historical account of what happened. It's not just representative stories. But there are many Bible-believing Christians who would claim to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they treasure the Word of God, who believe that the book of Genesis are, is full of crafted stories to simply explain reality. And they draw some of the same lessons that you and I would, but I, th I don't see a reason in reading the text. There is no hint that these are allegories or that these are fictional accounts or parables. It comes across as if it is um, actual accounts because they're followed by genealogies. And those genealogies are important. And we're going to see by the time that Abraham gets here, Abraham is not that far removed from the last generation of Noah. And people lived a long time. And before Noah and Adam, those people, the names that we read, they cross, they intersect for hundreds of years. They all are very familiar with the accounts that Moses has given by inspiration. So when Abraham comes along, he's only a few generations away from, from Noah. And many of those people coexist at the same time. We'll see that when we get to it. I think it'll fascinate you. It makes you look at the book of Genesis differently because you realize a lot of this is first-hand information being shared. People who actually saw it are what is talking about it, whatever that it might be. So let's look at your study sheet now. We'll fill in some of the stuff, or you can just add to it. The book of Genesis. Genesis is a Greek word, and it means origin, source, generations, or beginnings. And as a title given to this book, it comes from the Hebrew word Bereshith is the way we would pronounce it, it's Bereshet in Hebrew, and it means in beginning, not necessarily in the beginning, but in beginning. So the book of Genesis explains a number of things, the origins or the beginnings or the source of, first of all, the physical universe, all plant life, all animal life, all human life. 
So it's important for us to know in our theology, in our faith, where did everything come from? The book of Genesis tells us that, tells us the origins of marriage. Because where did that come from? Why do human beings make some kind of pledge to one another? Why aren't we more like animals who are, who are a cross-mate and they don't necessarily stay monogamous their entire lives? Why do we do that? It tells us the reason for the seasons. It gives us the source of where evil came from. One of the great questions of the world, not only where does evil come from, but why does it even exist? It tells us the origins of death. Why does everything die? Why does nothing live forever? It tells us the origins of human government. It answers a, an amazing question that we still argue about today in terms of race. Where do races come from? And where do languages come from? And it reads like it could be a make-believe story because it's just so miraculous, but it's an actual historical account of how this one form of man broke into different races or skin colors and um, languages. And then it gives us the reason or the source or the start of the nation of Israel. So all of those are very important to the Word of God. Now remember, the Bible is telling the story of salvation. So it doesn't necessarily tell you about China and about India and about other nations or the Aztec culture or the North American culture that may have existed in sometimes the same time that European culture was being developed. The Bible focuses on the story of Judaism and the plan of salvation. The book of Genesis explains, number two, man's place in the universe. It tells us why we have a broken relationship with God. It tells us that our broken relationship is also with fellow men. Why can't we get along with one another? And it tells us our only hope of redemption. So when you look for answers to these questions, you have to look to the Word of God. Today I was, I was in a session with somebody and we were talking about human nature and why people do the things you do. And we can come up with all sorts of reasons, exterior influences on you and me that, that lead us to make decisions, react in a certain way, or respond to a, an invitation, whether it is for good or for evil. And we can come up with all the ex exterior impulses, but the Bible explains to us the real core is who we are and what happened to us, how our nature got corrupted. That answers a very important question, and it puts us all in the same boat. So it answers the three great questions of life. Who are we? Where did we come from? Where are we going? How do we get there? And what is our purpose? And there's other major questions, but those are the ones that everybody tends to ask. Who are we? As in, are we different than animals? Or are we the same as animals? Where did we come from? How did we get here? Uh, did we come on a meteor that landed on earth and spread some bacteria that eventually evolved into human life? Where are we going once we leave here? Is there an afterlife? And if there is an afterlife, how do we get there? And in the meantime, what is the meaning of life? All of these are answered succinctly in the book of Genesis. So Genesis was written by Moses, and there's the verses that claim it, both the Old and the New Testament, because Jesus himself ascribed the Torah to Moses. We don't believe that Jesus was ever confused or misled or lied. So we accept Jesus' assessment that Moses wrote the Torah. The Jerusalem Talmud in the first century, Josephus, the first century historian, and the early church all believed Genesis was written by Moses, and it had to have been written between 1445 B.C., the date of the Exodus, to 1405 B.C., when their march through the wilderness was done, because it gives an account of some of that. So Genesis is written along with the Torah sometime in that time span, and it covers the book of Genesis between the years 2316 and 2356 on the Jewish calendar, which is very different than ours. So they start with year one in their mind through the biblical assessment of these ge genealogies where they don't go A.D. and B.C. Their years just continue to count. And so instead of happening in 1445 B.C., it happened in year 2316. The contents of Genesis span more than 2,000 years are covered in 50 chapters. And they cover six main events of human history, and those two main events, or those six main events, 
are in two sections. The first is primeval history. That's the creation, the fall of man, the flood, and then Babel. And primeval would sort of imply all before recorded history. So Moses is giving us what happened before man wrote anything down and before any writings survived the flood. That's primeval. The next is the patriarchal history or the history of Israel. It begins with Abraham, his call out of Ur, and then Israel's move into Egypt before it goes into the book of Exodus, which tells us what happens when they leave Egypt. Now, there's an interesting verse I want to look at tonight. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, in Hebrew, it reads right to left. So on your sheet, you'll see it says, Bereshet bara Elohim et hashamayim vet haretz. It reads right to left. That's the way that phrase means. And it's interesting, just for the sake of enjoying the fascinating aspects of, of Hebrew and the Bible, in the first seven words, we read about the creation of time, space, and matter. In the beginning, time, God created the heavens, space, and He created earth or, and all matter. In these first seven words, there are seven features of the number seven. That doesn't mean much to you and me. We are not, as American people, most of us aren't into what is called today numerology, what is called in Hebrew gematria, part of the uh, Jewish Kabbalah. But in that seven words, there's some hidden sevens which are just interesting. The first is it contains 28 Hebrew letters, and that's the number four times seven. It contains three main words, God, heaven, and earth. Those contain 14 letters, which is two times seven. The remaining four words also contain 14 letters. That is 2 times 7. The heavens and the earth, that phrase, contains 14 letters, and that is 2 times 7. The number of letters in the middle word and the words to its right and its left are both 7. And then the numeric value of the three main words, God, heaven, and earth, is 777. Seven, seven which is 86 plus 395 plus 296. That's all from gematria, the ancient art of meaning and significance and messages being multi-layered in the number equivalent. So if you look at a Hebrew alphabet, they'll have the letter, then they'll have a numerical value assigned to it. And that numerical value will tell you what it means as an individual, what it means when it's given with other letters, and how you come up with numerical values such as why is 666 the number of man? Gematria is what tells us that. And that's very important in Hebrew theology, Hebrew philosophy, and evidently it's in the Word of God. Uh, a few years ago a book came out called The Bible Code. The Bible Code was gematria. It was the application of where are all the hidden secrets in the Word of God? If you've ever read the book, it's fascinating. It's speculative. We certainly can't prove any of it. But he makes a pretty good case for all these hidden messages through the understanding of numbers. The numeric value of the only verb in those seven words, created, is 203 or 29 times 7. Now, all that sounds very you know, odd, but... This is the only seven-letter, seven-word section in the Bible that has seven features of the number seven. And to a Hebrew mindset, that means that phrase is incredibly powerful. It is crucial and foundational to everything that comes after because God took the time to put so much numerical significance and multi-layered meanings in those first seven words in the beginning, God created the space and God created all matter. But there's another one that you may have seen this on the Internet. It's a fascinating video by a man. I forget his name. I think Uncle Ben or something like that. But I thought it was interesting, and I checked it out to make sure it's true, and it is. The first word, Bereshith, contains a profound pictorial message. So if you look on your page, you'll see the letters. Now remember, it's right to left. Bet is the first letter. And there's the Hebrew letter there. And then the pictorial ancient uh, Arcadian letter is a tent. So if you turned it on its side, it would be a tent with an open way. That's a tent, but it's then vertical. The second letter is resh. 
and it is simply a head. Looks like the letter R, a backwards R, but the picture of it is a head. Aleph, which is the picture of an ox. Looks like a sideways V with a, an arc going through it. It's the horns of an ox. Shin, which is in the Hebrew letter like a W, but in the picture it is teeth. That looks like a sideways twisted W. Yod, which is a little um, apostrophe looking letter. Its picture is that of a hand doing work. And then Tau, which is simply a cross. So in those seven or those six pictures of the word Beresheth, which is in beginning, the first word of the Old Testament is a potential picture of the gospel. The tent and the head is the way the word is phrased, leader of the house. The leader of the house of God is destroyed by those teeth, by the hand of God on the cross. You can see the leader of the house God destroys for the work of the covenant. That word cross is also the symbolic letter for the word covenant. It is one of those hidden, if you want to call it a code or hidden sub-message, that the first word of the Bible in Hebrew, Bereshet, Bereshet, contains this message in pictorial form that God's Son, because the leader of the house is the Son, God's Son, the leader of the house, is destroyed by the hand of God for the covenant. And the covenant is done on the cross. Just one of those little interesting things that I found was fascinating about the book of Hebrews. And you can lose yourself in studying gematria all through the Bible and the Old Testament, but I thought that one was worth looking at. The sex phrase is bara Elohim, and it is God created. Elohim is God, and bara is to create. Elohim is plural, but bara is singular. And that's one of those hints, even to the ancient Jews, that God is not understood in the way that we understand things. God is a plural being, acts as an individual. Elohim being plural and bara being singular. It's an indication of the Trinity. Bara is used only in association with God's actions, not man's. So the word bara is only used when God acts. And it means to make from nothing. That's why only God can do it. When man acts, the word is asa or asa. And it means to make from something. So God created the plurality of the Trinity, the Godhead, created out of nothing everything that exists. When you and I make something, when man makes something, we asa. We make it out of stuff that already exists. And the word hashayim vet haretz is heaven and earth and can be translated more um, uh, specifically as sky and land. God made the heavens and the earth. In Scripture, there are three heavens. There's the heaven of the sky around that we look at and see. There's the heavens of the atmosphere and the stars. Then there's the heavens where God dwells. And I put the verses there for you to look at. The Bible says here God made all of that in the beginning. He makes the heavens and the earth. And that little paragraph there I wrote out for you, I wanted you to be able to read it because it's astounding. And if I just said the numbers to you, you'd lose it. But our galaxy is 100,000 light years wide. A light year is how much time or how much distance it takes for light to travel in a year. And I think light travels at 186,000 miles a second or something like that. So how long can light travel in one year? That's a light year. Our galaxy is 100, was 100,000 of those. So if you can picture how fast light travels, how far can it go in 100,000 years? That's how big just our galaxy is. And our galaxy is not the biggest one. And it's only one of billions of galaxies all of which almost are bigger than ours. Every galaxy is separated from the other galaxies by three million light years. So here you have a galaxy 100,000 light years long. You stack up 10 of those, you have 1 million. 
You stack up 30 of those, you have 3 million. So 3 million of those over there is the next galaxy. And that's the closest any galaxies are, and there's billions of them. That's how vast the universe is. And, and this is just even impossible to believe or comprehend, they are moving away from each other at 200 million miles per hour. So these galaxies that are 3 million light years away from each other are doing this at 200 million miles an hour. The universe is expanding so rapidly. If you and I could leave Earth in a spaceship, we could never get to the end. By the time we got to where we thought was the end, it only would have expanded some hundreds of millions of light years. The Bible talks about that. Now, the furthest galaxy today is, now, this is a number you can't comprehend, because I can't, and I don't know anybody can, is 8 billion light years away. 8 billion, not 8 billion years, 8 billion light years. So if you could take a light cannon and shoot a cannon going out 186,000 miles a second, it would take 8 billion years to get to the furthest galaxy out there, and that galaxy is moving away at 200 million miles an hour. And I say all that just to humble us about the scope of what Genesis 1-1 is saying. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the other Old Testament passages tell us He stretches them out like the heavens, as if it's doing this, and the stretching is gone, and they continue to go. It's the reason why scientists think there was a big bang that everything started in one core and it exploded and it's going out because they can register the movement. What well, the Bible said 2,000 years ago, God did this. He stretched it out. How they knew that could only have been done by divine revelation. Genesis 1-2, the verse that is the rationale for what used to be called the gap theory. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. This is the verse where it has been read into it that somewhere between God made the heaven and the earth and verse 2, there's a gap where everything went bad. Everything went wrong. The dinosaurs were made and destroyed. Man was made. Atlantis maybe existed. But everything existed and it got so messed up, God destroyed it all. And it was without form and void. And then he recreates it. But none of those words, none of that meaning is in the verse. You have to read it into, and the reason for it to be read into was to try to explain fossils. And to try to explain where, where are all these creatures who are bigger than anything we can imagine today? Where, where are they? They had to have existed in a world before Adam. So they had to find a place to put it in the Bible, and it's there. But it's not there contextually. The Bible does not say they became without form and void after they were formed, but it was without form and void in its first stage of creation, which is an indeterminate amount of time. When God is making the heavens and the earth in that beginning, we don't know what that time frame was because time did not exist until God spoke it into existence. We don't know. Was it a day? Was it a moment? Was it a second? Was it a million years you could argue in and out, but it wasn't made and then became without form and void. God made it without form and void, and like a potter with the clay, brought forth from it all the beauty we see. Darkness indicates the absence of light, not the presence of evil. So there are many theologians who say the world was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. That was the indication that sin had corrupted the earth and God had to destroy it before he ever even made Adam, and he destroyed it a second time with the flood. And that's how they explain how things may have been so different prior to the Garden of Eden. The phrase, the Spirit of God was hovering, is an interesting word, and it's rakaf, and it means a vibrating or emanating energy. And I couldn't really tell you what that was until last week I went to the dentist, and after the dentist told me I had an unruly amount of plaque in my teeth because I wasn't flossing properly. He said, you need to get this toothbrush called Sonic Care. And you don't brush, you don't move the brush, you just hold it. 
And for somebody like me, it's the it's an exercise and discipline every night to sit there and hold something against my tooth. And it goes and it's vibrating and sending sonic waves and it's breaking up stuff or keeping it from building on my teeth. But you have to do it for three minutes. Three minutes is nothing unless you're doing this. And you have to move it real slow across the front. While my wife is standing over here at her sink looking at me, it's like It's, it's, it's the longest three minutes of my day. It's against my nature to take anything that slow. But that's what that vibrating energy, it's the same kind of idea. The Spirit of God is hovering in a vibrating presence of energy. That, well, that's what that word means. What it actually means in application, we don't know. Other than the creative energy of the Holy Spirit was hovering there over those waters. There's two verses there for you where they use that same word, Deuteronomy 32, 11, as an eagle stirs up her nest, flutters over her young, and that's not this. That's when they, they shudder, like when they clean their leaves. That's what the fluttering means. It's a, it's a quick vibration. Spreads abroad her wings, takes them in, and then bears them on her wings. Jeremiah 23, 9, my heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. The way you do if you have Parkinson's disease or some other neurological disorder and your hand just shakes. It's a repetitive, uh, fast movement. That's the phrase, the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. Then the words, and God said, which we'll get to actually uh, next week, following these first two verses, that completes this indirect reference to the Trinity. We have God, we have the Spirit hovering over the waters, and then we have said or the Word. So we have in these first three verses, and then the story of creation, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God being spoken, which is why John says in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, was with God, and the Word was God, and nothing that was made was made without the Word. The presence of Jesus Christ Himself, and the Holy Spirit, and God the Father present at creation. And just a side note, the creation of angels is not specified in Genesis. But most conservative Bible scholars lean towards their idea that they were created sometime in that first week of creation, possibly on the fourth day, because of Job 38, 4, 7, when it talks about the stars rejoice as the sons of God being created in that day. But the Bible doesn't really tell us when angels were created, but they are created beings. They are not divine ones. They are creations of God. Only the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in the beginning made everything, time, space, what since probably the 60s, I guess, maybe the 50s, has been called the time-space continuum. It's announced in Genesis 1.1. And it's not defended, uh, which is an interesting aspect of Scripture. The Bible doesn't say, here's what I'm telling you, and here's why it makes sense. Or, here's my defense. It just declares truth. And the greatest book in all of human history just simply says, in the beginning, God made everything. So if you don't take that as the answer, then all the other things that extrapolate out from it are just as questionable, which is why Moses, uh, Jesus said to, to the Jews, if you didn't believe Moses, you're not going to believe me. The Old Testament is critical to the foundation of the New Testament. It sits on now those truths that God made everything. And then you get back to the book of Revelation. Before he did that, the lamb or the word was slain, which shows you the transcendent nature of God. That before he did any of this, he knew his son was going to have to die, and he announced it in the Garden of Eden. So next week we'll talk about some of the great truths and what verse they're found in in Genesis upon which we base our entire theology. It all comes from the book of Genesis. It reads like a wonderful story, and God, in His wisdom, presents it to us in that format as a narrative, but in that narrative of that small group of people, a minority of the world, the Jews, comes the great history of mankind that is unfolding before us, and someday will be resolved with the return of the Messiah of that small group of people, beginning with those first two, where God said to the serpent, 
a seed of the woman will rise up and crush your head, that's Jesus. Although his heel has been bruised, and that's the cross. So the gospel is seen in Genesis, and we'll be looking at that. And then we're going to answer questions about the Tower of Babel, about the flood, the scientific nature of it. Is it, is it defendable and, and academics? Is there evidence that would show this is a plausible explanation for things? We'll look at all that as we go through the study, but we're not going to hurry through it so that we can sort of internalize it and understand it. Let's have a word of prayer, and you can take some of these thoughts and ponder on them tonight as you think about the vastness of the universe. And wherever God sits, He sees it all. And earth is not that far from Him. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank You that You are the Creator of all things, and Your Spirit was hovering over the waters, and Your Son was there as the Word being spoken to create all life and all matter, all energy, all light. We ask You to help us to understand that our faith goes much deeper than simply the stories of the prophets and the stories of the heroes and the patriarchs and the, and the beautiful stories of Jesus that many take to just be life lessons and, and um, morals for living, that it really is much deeper than that. And it gives us the entire meaning of why we even exist and what the real hope is of our future and that there is a life after death. Help us understand and accept and embrace and rejoice in the truths of your word. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank each one of you for coming tonight. Hope you were uh, um, challenged or provoked, thought provoked from the lesson. And we'll see you again next Wednesday or maybe this Sunday. This Sunday, by the way, is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And let me invite you, if you know, if you know of a young woman who is in the birth-bearing uh, age, it might be good for her to be here. We want to talk about life in the womb and the miracle of life. And you don't often hear that every place. And this would be a good place to hear it in church as we marvel at the creation of God. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you Sunday.